again and welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and today we'll be looking at peach tree care, vertical gardening, and we'll talk about climate concerns for your home garden. We'll start today's program by hearing from backyard farmer panelist Matt Soshik, who's going to cover a lot of ground about keeping your turf green and lush the whole season long. we've talked a lot about different specific topics looking at pre-emergent looking at broadleaf weeds looking at you know different ways to control certain weeds but in the big scheme of things in order to have a nice healthy lawn you have to look at the big picture and the the main thing you want to do is have a healthy lawn first and then work on the problems later so it comes down to an integrated pest management approach where you want to make sure that you're doing all the correct practices and that starts with watering fertilizer chemicals and then, you know, the, the weather, natural events can play a role in that too, that we don't have a say in, and it just occurs. But if we set ourselves up uh, to be better, or to make it better, we can have a healthier lawn with less maintenance. Uh, so for starters, if we're looking at the beginning of the year, typically April, May is when we're gonna start getting out on the lawn and actually doing some work. And that usually starts with pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, and also, you know, general cleanup, maybe the first mowing, first couple mowings, a uh, little bit of fertilizer. Uh, so that's, that's the first step that we're going to start with. Uh, generally, watering isn't as big of an issue in the spring. We don't want to overwater because uh, springtime usually we get plenty of moisture and a lot of heavier rain events, so we don't want to be uh, making our lawn wetter than it needs to be. Uh, so starting with pre-emergence, you know, weeds in the spring, crabgrass, Foxtail will start coming, uh, knotweed can be a bad one, and if you're trying to control some of those, you're going to have to think about a pre-emergent earlier in the year, or come back with some post-control uh, to control those weeds, such as quinclorac for uh, crabgrass, or for knotweed, you're going to have to use a broadleaf herbicide. Uh, not only do we have, you know, grassy weeds, we do have uh, dandelions, clover, which are the most common ones in the spring, and we're going to be seeing them bloom in May like crazy, so we want to control them before that happens. And if we didn't get a fall knockdown with some broadleaf herbicide, you're going to have to do something in order to get rid of those yellow, yellow flowers that are going to be coming out. Uh, so that's kind of looking at the first step, you know, May, April, May. Now we get into June. Um, we should have had our pre-emergent down. We might be putting a second app of pre-emergent down if we do have some trouble areas. Uh, not only that, but escapes broadleaves. We're going to do a broadleaf application. Uh, in the springtime, summertime, I'd never recommend just using 2,4-D. Um, there's a lot of volatization issues with high heat in the summer and also in the early spring. So some of the three-way products that contain 2,4-D, dicamba, Mech mechaprop have a lot better uh, carriers for those and they're a lot lower active ingredients, so they're not going to be as big of a risk when you're spraying around a lot of the susceptible trees, shrubs, landscape, uh, ornamentals. Uh, so typically that time of year, you also maybe have nut sedge applications going down. You're going to look at controlling post with maybe sedge hammer or sulfentrazone. Those are two great products that work. Um, and then also fertilizer at that time of year is important to have a healthy lawn. So you're looking at a half to three quarters of a pound of fertilizer in that, let's say, May 15th to June 30th time frame. Uh, if we get through that, uh, you know, crabgrasses, if we did miss it, there's going to be some issues with, uh, let's say, the pre-emergent failed or we didn't get it out soon enough. Uh, let's say that June, July time frame, your third app, you might have to go in with some post-control treatments for crabgrass or grassy weeds, foxtail, uh, whatever other ones you may have out there. And some of the great products that work for those is uh, quinclorac, which is a great one for grassy weeds, and it also covers clover and some broadleaf weeds too. Um, Tenacity is another one that we've used on post crabgrass, and so is uh, Pilex. That's another one that's newer to the market. It's in some granular uh, herbicides or carrier fertilizer herbicides that it does a well, good job of controlling crabgrass. Um, so typically in July, you know, a little bit of fertilizer can be put out too, but we don't want to go too high in the middle of the summer, but it does, it does still need maybe a half a pound. Um, so we get through the, the heat of the summer, let's say the, the fourth step, we might be getting into August, September, and typically that time of the year, uh, crabgrass is already 
pretty fully grown. We're not going to look at too much control on that because it might be too far along and it's not very cost effective to spray it unless you have a really high maintenance area. Uh, along with that, uh, post-emergent herbicides is probably the, the most important for broadleaf weeds in that time frame. September, even into October or even in November, uh, the most important time to control a lot of the dandelion, clover, uh, ground ivy. Those are probably the best uh, best case scenario for treating those later in the year and you're going to get great control going into the winter and then you won't have the problem in the spring when control is not as easy. Uh, not only do you have to you know know when and how to use your herbicides but also just the standard practices of mowing and simply pulling weeds uh, are justified at some times. So if you have areas in your lawn that are thinned or just a couple here and there you know, it might not make sense for you to go out there and actually spray the whole yard or treat the whole yard, but just on a, uh, let's say, square foot basis. If there's a small area, you can manage it by hand. Uh, and with that, mowing is very important in controlling weeds as well. Uh, the lower you mow the lawn, the more increase in weed pressure there's going to be because sunlight's able to get below that turf canopy to the ground, warm it up, and that actually spurs uh, the growth of new uh, seedlings that are from previous weed, weed banks. So when looking at mowing height, uh, for tall fescue, two to three inches would be optimal and you're not going to have very much weed pressure if you're doing your other cultural practices correct. If you're trying to take it down to one inch, it's going to be a little bit stressed, the canopy is going to be opened up and you're going to be more prone to weeds. The same goes for bluegrass. Um, mowing it as low as you can go is not the best choice. You want to give that a little bit of top growth, at least two inches to two and a half and that way you're out competing those weeds that are trying to get through the canopy. If you want turf in your lawn you want it to look lush and that's going to take some effort as Matt said. You'll have to keep an eye on the calendar as well as the amount of rainfall you're getting in order to keep that grass green and to stay on top of those pesky weeds. We've been focusing on trends this year for our landscape lessons. For today's feature we'll show you some ideas for growing up of course, I'm talking about vertical gardening, and as you'll see, it is a great technique for when you don't have a lot of space or you just want to try something really creative. We're continuing talking about garden trends for 2020, and one of the ones that is really important and fun is vertical gardening. We've done segments on this before. It's really coming back into a lot more style and vogue as people are thinking, can I go up instead of out, especially in an urban situation. It's a little hard to find a vertical green wall outside in the middle of the winter, but this is a great example of some of the possibilities. So what you need to think about is the material that you want to use to actually create that vertical space how complex you want to be, and then of course what you want to grow on that wall. In this particular instance, it's a combination of all sorts of different materials. We have everything as something as simple as hardware cloth that then can be stuffed with, with the mosses and the coir and the kinds of small little breathable materials that will let plants grow in them. This one actually also has regular old shelf brackets and then the shelf brackets are holding boxes. And then within the boxes, we have that growing medium and then of course the plants. The other thing that this wall has that is possible depending on the material you have outside is this one has a fig actually attaching itself to the structure. What you also need to be thinking about is the complexity of the management of these walls. Because just like everything else in the landscape, this is not a set it, forget it, walk away and think you never have to do anything again. That is particularly true if what you're trying to do is grow plants that you can eat on this particular vertical garden wall. You have a lot of options with vertical gardening that are actually sort of temporary, just in case you change your mind. As an example, these sorts of structures could sit in a container. You could grow vines, you could grow peas, even if you want something to eat. They can also sit in the garden and then become a part of the landscape or the sculpture. Other options are, of course, the trellises. And they are, again, pretty tough and pretty sturdy and freestanding. People always think of these trellises, whether it is the metal one or the wood one, as something that is just sort of flat 
in the garden. But you can hang containers on them. You could take the containers or the boxes that we saw in the previous shot, hang them on these frames and move them around. You can always also use the window box kind of frame that has the core in it that becomes another option for just creating something really interesting. Then you also have structures like this. And this one is obviously pre-made, but pretty simple because what you can do with this one is you can actually open it wide, set it low, grow vines up, hang plants on it, hang plants in it. When you are finished with the season, you simply close that up and put it away, or you could actually make it really narrow and then it gets taller. So you really do have a lot of flexibility with this garden trend. And of course, as with all things landscape, you start with what you're trying to accomplish. You take a look at the site or the location where you're wanting to grow those plants. Then you choose the plants and then you decide about the complexity of the management system, whether it is you with a watering can on a ladder if you're really short or whether you have a system that is absolutely automatic. Vertical gardening helps you create interest and beauty and it can also help you save space. You can create those green spaces on walls or you can try one of the numerous trellises we just saw. And it's another great way to reuse or recycle some of the structures you might already have in your garden. You know, each week on Lifestyle Garden, we like to talk to an expert about important topics in the landscape world. Today, we're going to be hearing from Extension Educator Tyler Williams about climate concerns and how those might affect your home garden. I get to talk today with Tyler Williams, who is a Nebraska Extension Educator who focuses on weather and climate. And Tyler, I know that a lot of your work really is with agronomy and agricultural producers and across the state with the farm community. And of course, our show is really a more focused on people in urban areas, in their own backyards. We do stretch into acreages and those kinds of things. So can you start by talking a bit about what you know and what you understand about the ag side and how that really affects the urban side? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the nice thing about ag and urban areas. They're still dealing with the same climate and weather, right? It doesn't, doesn't stop at the edge of town. So uh, that part's easy. You know, there are a you know, number of weather patterns and uh, climate variables that come into play that, that you know, I focus on in the ag world that would impact urban settings probably pretty similar way. You know, that you, you think about temperature, right? Temperature is a pretty easy one that, you know, influences how things grow. It uh, doesn't matter if it's a flower or a corn plant or a soybean plant, that changes in that temperature influence how it might work. And so, um, you know, one of the, the big things that, that we've seen here in Nebraska is, you know, the, the, the change in temperature over time, as well as some seasonal shifts in precipitation. Mm -hmm. um, so if we just focus on temperature for a minute, you know, the, the long-term trend from 1895, we've increased about one to two degrees. Uh, which isn't a lot if you think about, you know, for over 125 years. Uh, but in the last uh, roughly 30 years, 35 years, we've been above the last century average, right? So we're, we, we've slowly increased, but we've just been maintaining above the average. And so we've been pretty consistent um, in that trend. Again, we have year to year variations. Just look back to 2019. We were the th third coldest uh, year we've had since 1895. 1895. So how does that fit into this long term? pattern, right? And so we get those ups and downs, uh, but overall that trend's been fairly consistent. Uh, when it comes to precipitation, uh, we've seen a pretty strong uptick in spring precipitation. Uh, we see that that's increased about an inch and a half over the last 30 to 35 years for across the state. Of course, there's a big variation across our state from one end to the next, right. but overall an inch and a half, it makes a difference. It's, you know, mm -hmm. an extra 20 percent of rain uh, in, you know, a season uh, can make a big difference on, you know, too wet or at all coming in one event, and that has you know, some influences in how um, our plants grow and maybe how we should design our urban structures or um, how we lay out a field of, of corn. It, it's, all, it's all impacted. So I'm glad you brought up both of those issues because of course in the plant world we think first about the zone that we're in, and we have seen a shift. We're a 5AB zone, and of course that's mm -hmm. only one element of what causes a plant to either grow well or, n or not grow well. And I know what people are also then interested in is not just what did happen in 2019, everything from the temperature to a lot of moisture. A lot, a lot, a lot of moisture. <laughs> but what, any notion on what we might expect in 2020 
uh, if you get to predict the weather or, <laughs> or take a look at where those trends are going. Right, yeah, so if I predict the weather right, you know, I probably should go to Vegas and uh, <laughs> right. put it all in black or something. But, um, you know, what, right now we're sitting and we're sort of vulnerable, I would say, right mm -hmm. now. Um, after the issues that we had last year with all the excess water and flooding and frozen soils, um, we had a lot of infrastructure that was damaged and, you know, things were really pushed to the limit. If they weren't broken, they were tested. Uh, but our, we're sitting with a lot of moisture in our system. Our soils are pretty much fully saturated. Mm -hmm. Most of the reservoirs and rivers are, you know, relatively high where, you know, there really isn't any extra room for more water. And so that's probably our biggest concern is if we have a normal year, we probably will still have some flooding issues, especially if you're along one of the rivers. Um, so if we think, okay, the chances of having normal are probably pretty good, above normal is decent. So there's, you know, a pretty good chance that we could see, you know, enhanced flooding, you know, probably not to the, the level that we had last year, of course, because that was, a lot of things came together to make that an issue. But there will be flooding somewhere this year that, that will be a problem. And so, um, you know, think about what maybe worked last year, what, what failed last year, um, and try to think about what what you would do differently if that happened again. Because as we've seen trends over time, we've been seeing this trend coming out of winter of being very cold in February uh, and overlapping with uh, excess moisture and enhanced right. precipitation. So that overlapping of that very cold and then switch quickly to wet pattern brings into high risk of what we had last year of having that rain on the frozen soil. Um, so I don't, see that that, I don't see that risk going down anytime soon. And that does apply in town as well as people's Absolutely. basements flood and they can't get into their garden and all those things that we really want to do as we get desperate for spring. Yeah. I think one more issue and one more comment I'd like to have you think about or, or comment on is wind. Our wind patterns seem to be a lot more severe in some locations and of course plants don't feel wind chill even though we all whine about it but what have you seen or what do you see with sort of these violent and, and unpredictable or higher wind patterns in, in the ag or, or the uh, landscape sectors. Yeah, and so overall that, you know, I don't know if we've seen the shift in like wind storms, um, but the timing of them when they, when they happen mm -hmm. seems to be further out in the seasons, a little bit later in the year. Um, I'm gonna, I'll talk specifically to ag setting here, but a high wind event in October or September is really devastating to a corn crop because it knocks right. off all of the, um, the corn, the ears of corn when the plant's dying, and so it's pretty hard to get that off the ground. Um, you know, so we've seen that, that, you know, the susceptibility of those storms later in the year um, has been quite common in the last few years. Uh, projections for those are, are way up in the air uh, as far as if that will continue or if that's right. just kind of a short pattern, uh, just because it's convective systems are really hard to predict and forecast because there's a lot of variables at play. But, um, you know, we've, we've definitely felt this higher humidity um, you know, does that play a role in, um, in these thunderstorm events and where they happen and when they happen? Um, that probably takes a lot of person or someone smarter than me to figure that out, but um, certainly we've seen that that shoulder part of the seasons have had those th thunderstorm events that we're not typically used to having. All right, so this has been great, Tyler. I know we just barely touched the surface, <laughs> so we'll hope to have you back uh, either on The Real Show or one of our other shows, but in the meantime, mm -hmm. It's kind of, you can't dink with Mother Nature, so just get ready f for whatever she's going to throw <laughs> our way. Yeah, it's, it's something different every year. It's always something. All right, thanks, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Understanding climate issues can help you be more flexible in the garden. The scorching drought in 2012, and of course the recent flooding, has taught all of us to be prepared for just about anything in Nebraska. Let's take a break and hear some answers to your frequently asked questions. Our Backyard Farmer panelists are here to help you with some of the more basic garden questions that we hear on the show. And even though Backyard Farmer isn't on the air right now, you can always send us an email. That address is byf at unl.edu. So right now at this time through winter and early spring, we want to pick those bagworms off. So right now they may be eggs in some of those bags. Some of them may be empty, but sometimes we don't know. Those bags will be hard to pull off because they're attached to those um, twigs uh, with really strong silk. So you may want to go out with some scissors and cut those down and destroy those bags. 
come May, usually near the end, is when the little caterpillars are going to hatch out of those bags, so we want to get them before that. And that's what we can do right now. After they hatch, you may want to, uh, well, look very closely. They're going to be super tiny. We would say to treat with um, BT and make sure it's for caterpillars. You want to treat around the middle of June, so that way we know that all of the caterpillars have emerged. With BT, it really depends on the thoroughness of treating that plant that it's on so that they can um, consume the toxins and um, die after feeding. Once the bags get about half an inch long, they have a lot of silk and they have a lot of protection, so that's going to be harder to um, kill them with that um, insecticide. Spinosad might be a good um, product to use. And then after they get really large, you may want to use some other conventional insecticides. But again, picking them off is going to be the best way to control those. So I know a lot of gardeners are itching to get out in the garden and they're ready to plant whenever uh, the season warms up. And a lot of people, especially with their fruits and vegetables, they wait until, well, they say, I have to wait until Mother's Day to plant this because that's whenever we typically have our last frost in most of the state. And so we're out planting all of those things that wouldn't survive a frost. But guess what? There's lots of things that we can actually get out and plant way before that and those are the cool season vegetables. And those are things that we can think about in the winter because we can actually get out much earlier and plant those. So we're thinking about things like leafy greens, lettuces, kale, uh, other Asian greens, uh, some of the mustards, things like that, that you can actually get out and plant pretty early on in the season. You can also think about things like peas. They do, do very well whenever the, the cool weather is still going. Uh, as well as some of the root crops like radishes and carrots. What you want to take a look at is to look at the actual soil temperature, and that's what's important for crops like this. So the air temperature might be one thing, but the soil temperature changes much more slowly. So you can actually find weather stations in your area uh, that actually have a soil probe temperature. You can actually look that up online and find the real-time soil temperature to see when it's time to plant these crops. For some of, it, it's, some of them, it's going to be in the range of about 40 to 45 and 50 degrees when you can actually start planting some of those things, uh, which is way earlier than if you were planting tomatoes and peppers. So you want to be on the lookout, and you can do a little research because some of those crops have different needs and different temperature needs. Some of them will sort of hang out in the soil until it's time to germinate but some of them won't because we have all kinds of fungi and bacteria in the soil that are just there waiting for a fresh seed to drop for them to eat. And if it takes too long to germinate, they might rot in the soil. So you wanna take a look for some of those temperatures and some of those early crops that you can incorporate into your garden and get out early before Mother's Day and get those things in the garden so you can have a bountiful harvest even before May and June rolls around. Stay tuned to Lifestyle Gardening as we'll cover more frequently asked questions on our upcoming programs. For our final feature today, we're going to hear from former Kimmel Orchard manager Vaughn Hammond about proper peach tree care. Vaughn will focus on good pruning techniques you should be aware of, and he's also going to keep you up to date on controlling those insect pests that might attack those peach trees. You know, in spite of what Mother Nature threw at us in Nebraska this year, people are still hopeful for that great peach off the tree. So I get to talk to Vaughn Hammond about how exactly to prune your peach trees. Vaughn, pruning peaches is a little different than pruning apples, so when do we prune peaches for the best results? Peaches are a little bit different. They are such a early blooming type of fruit along with apricots that really we wait to the very last minute to prune peaches just in case we get that really early or I guess it would be really late freeze. So Vaughn, why exactly do we prune the peaches the way we prune them? Same reason we prune for apple trees. We're really opening up that tree for the increased sunlight penetration and again the increased air movement throughout the, the structure of the tree itself. 
All right, Vaughn, the technique for pruning peaches also looks to be a little bit different than it is for the one that we use for apples. Is this true? Okay, unlike the apple tree, we still want to have a very open tree. So we're pruning to an open vase system where sunlight can penetrate down into the center of that tree. The other difference is that we're really looking for only three to four at the most scaffold branches in which to produce that fruit and, and all the, the wood that's off of it. Peach trees are, are really quite unique in that peaches bear fruit on one-year-old wood. And it's really easy to tell one-year-old wood on a, on a peach tree because it tends to be very vibrant in color. It can be vibrant orange or red or even tending towards yellow. But it's really important to realize that that brightly colored wood is where that this year's peaches are coming from themselves. One thing about this tree, you can tell that there's a lot of growth you're really looking for about 18 inches maximum so when you're pruning you're coming back and tipping each and every one of these branches in order to create a good stable structure for that peach to hang off of. So one of the main insect pests, actually two insect pests, that attack peaches is the greater and the lesser peach tree bore. One attacks the trunk, the other at attacks the scaffold branches just three to four foot out from the trunk. It tends to be a little bit larger wood, whereas wood this size is too small for the peach, peach tree bore to actually attack. It needs to have a little bit more substantial size to it in order for the peach tree bore to penetrate. So I really appreciate that information and I'm sure our audience just can't wait to bite into that luscious peach. Yeah, and don't forget to use the napkin. <laughs> Good pruning can make a world of difference in how your peach tree performs this season. We can't do anything about the weather, but we can put good practices to use to keep those peaches healthy. Thanks again for joining us for Lifestyle Gardening. Next time we'll show you some more garden trends and we'll take a look at some incredible color combinations at the Garden Center. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good morning, good gardening, thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.